It's great pleasure uh, to welcome Sir Mason Jury of Rangatani, Nati Kofata, Nati Rakawa uh, to the stage today. We're greatly honoured to have uh, Sir Mason with us today. Uh, I don't think any New Zealander needs to be introduced to Sir Mason. But for those who uh, come from overseas, uh, I will give a, for a short roundup. Uh, he is an emeritus professor, and uh, I won't read all the alphabetical letters after his name, but it nearly constitutes the whole alphabet. During his long career, Sir Mason has been instrumental in transforming Maori healthcare in New Zealand. He initially did his training in medical school in Otago and then in McGill in Canada, uh, and came the director of psychiatry at Palmerston North Hospital uh, until in 1988. Uh, he was nominated to the Royal Commission on Social Policy as a full-time commissioner. He was the first professor of Maori studies at the Palmerston North, the University at Palmerston North. Alongside a demanding career uh, in clinical psychiatry and then in academia, he has served on many, many Maori health committees, influential uh, community and national bodies, too many for us really to give justice to. He has made countless contributions to Maori education and mental health care. From very early in his clinical practice, he established the importance of considering the cultural and environmental uh, dimensions in Maori health care and well-being. In his own words, we should strive to build a future where Maori can have good health and a high standard of living and where we can live as Maori and as citizens in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Mason Jury. Tūtai, kei te tautou ko ngā mihi ki a koutou o Ngāti Whātua, nā koutou te karanga, nā koutou hoki te pōhiri, nā koutou hoki whakamāra mā ngā taku e pāna kei tātou i tēnei ata. Nō reira Ngāti Whātua tēnā tātou katoa i tā koutou manāki tanga mai ki a mātou. O te rai i tēnei wā kei te mauma haro hoki ngā whakāro Ko e tahi o ngā rangotera Māori, nā rāua i whakatō te kaupapa mō tātou o te iwi, ahako ko wehi atu kei te mau tōnu o rātou whakāro. So thank you for the uh, welcome to this conference and for the honour of being able to talk uh, to so many physicians. You can always tell when physicians are in deep trouble. When the tests have come back negative, the trial on medication has failed, and they don't know what to do, they ask for a psychiatric opinion. <laughs> what uh, I'm talking about today is working and living at the interface, and I'm talking about how we live where there are two bodies of knowledge that don't necessarily see the world from the same perspective, but are both important parts of the world that we live in. And we live at a place uh, called the interface. If I just take you back in time that uh, this dilemma is not a new one, that there have been differences between faith-based knowledge on the one hand and science on the other, and it was well illustrated in 1603 when the Lincian Academy was established, and that was the very, one of the very early scientific movements that began to put science on the radar and gave uh, great credit to how to study nature, uh, especially mathematics, and not to neglect the other side the, of literature and philology. And they had quite graceful language, which, uh, like graceful garments, adorn the whole body of science. But part of that debate also included a man called Galileo, uh, regarded really as the father of modern uh, astronomy, the father of modern physics, the father of science, and the father of modern science. Uh, he made an important discovery 
and it was that the earth revolved around the sun, the sun didn't revolve around the earth. That was radical thinking in its time because the tradi traditional faith-based teaching had been that the earth was the center of everything and the sun revolved around the earth. So his observations uh, were eventually published and in his, uh, in his publication, he made it very clear that it was the earth that traveled around the sun. He landed into huge conflict with uh, religious leaders and uh, Pope Urbain uh, in demanded an inquisition and because of his publication, he was convicted of heresy, placed under house arrest where he remained until he died. His, the dialogue which contained his publication was banned and all other works placed, and his other works were placed on a list of prohibited books for 200 years. And it was not until 1992 that Pope John Paul II endorsed Galileo as a great scientist. So that's a long time to wait to get your thesis marked. <laughs> uh, here we are 400 years later. Science is the dominant knowledge system. Science has been described as making the modern world and it's science that shapes the modern world. It's science that drives the economy. More pervasively, it's science that shapes our culture. We think in scientific terms. Science has really replaced what faith was 400 years ago. But there are many, many bodies of knowledge. There's not one or two. Science, as we've heard, is probably the dominant one. There are knowledges based on faith, from religion, on creativity. The humanities have a different approach to knowledge. The uh, lawyers have a different approach to knowledge. Uh, commerce has its own forms. And then there's indigenous knowledge. And what I want to talk about uh, today is a little bit about the difference between science on the one hand and indigenous knowledge on the other. And to do that, I'd uh, suggest we uh, just want to talk about a clinical encounter in 1964 at the Palmerston North Hospital when I was a house surgeon and uh, working with three uh, great physicians, Dick Wigley, Lewis Beter, and Murray Kirk. And the encounter then involved a, uh, an elderly Maori ma man, uh, koro, koro is a word for grandfather or older person, and a very knowledgeable but not very wise house surgeon. The patient was a 14-year-old Maori girl. For two weeks she had been having some behavioral changes at school. The teachers became very annoyed with her, and uh, when, particularly when she started singing in class, and they refused to have her in class. That suited her because she refused to go to school anyway. Uh, she complained of headaches, became very confused, and then three days before she was admission, she became quite excited and couldn't be controlled, began to have visual hallucinations, her speech was garbled, and then she had a seizure and was admitted to the Palmerston North Hospital, semiconatose, severe neck stiffness, and a diagnosis of delirium secondary to viral encephalitis. So this, this was a, a sick girl uh, admitted she had to travel uh, some 30 miles to get to hospital, but did so. The grandfather, Koro, was her caregiver. He looked after, he was the only visitor that she had during her stay in hospital. Uh, he was a shearing contractor, so he would organize, get up early, organize his gang, and then come into the hospital and sit with his granddaughter. Most of the, he spent just about every day there at her bedside, in those days, visitors were only allowed between the hours of two and three, but he had a way of persuading the uh, sister in charge of the ward that he could stay, and so he, he did. Every day he brought flowers and some green leaves, didn't say very much, just sat quietly and made very few requests on the staff uh, at all. The house surgeon was Maori, very recent graduate, knew everything, uh, very keen, but not very wise. 
And uh, this story was about how wisdom began to be transferred. There was an initial conversation with Kurul, and uh, he made the comment, Doctor, is it okay to leave these flowers and the leaves here all, here all night? In those days, you couldn't leave the flowers in the same room as the patient at night time because they were said to put out carbon dioxide, and that was bad for health. So the house surgeon uh, said, no, the nurses move them into the corridor at night, but are they still close to the room? Yes, they're just put outside your room. Is that important? His response was, Doctor, these leaves come from our place, Kawakawa, Karamu, and Kofai, native trees. Will they help her? And he said, Doctor, they are part of her. And the house surgeon uh, was speechless. He had discovered even then that if you don't know what to say, you're probably better not to say it. A later conversation with Coral. Coral, it seemed to take a long time before your granddaughter was admitted to hospital. Well, my own doctor thought she was mental or just playing up and trying to skip school. Did he give you any advice? When I called him about her visions and her strange talking, he said he would have her committed to put it to a mental hospital, a large mental hospital near Wellington. So what did you do? I didn't know much about it, but I knew she was sick and ought to be in hospital, so I just drove her here. He was a little bit concerned that he had gone against the advice of his doctor and that might lead him into some trouble, but he knew intuitively that he, she ought to be in the Palmerston North Hospital. Then there was a, a later conversation. We used to have conversations after the ward round when I had to go back to the ward and uh, he would talk to him for a while. Uh, Cora, you said this morning that you knew what caused the illness. He said, yes, my moko, his granddaughter, was a victim of maukutu. Maukutu is a type of curse that can be placed on people from a distance. How do you mean? Well, her mother, that's my daughter, went to Australia with another man and her husband's family took their revenge. The house surgeon says, that sounds a little hard to believe. An illness such as this does not develop because of an unseen curse or a mysterious force. Well, doctor, what do you think caused the illness? It was a virus. A virus? What did it look like? Well, actually, I never saw it. But did you touch it or smell it or taste it? No. Doctor, I admire your faith in unseen things <laughs> and your belief in the power of invisible forces. <laughs> and once again, the house surgeon was speechless. Well, it took uh, many years before I realised that what Koro had been talking about actually was conveying five really important matters that I needed to consider as a doctor. And the first one, you remember, was this question about mental health and physical health. And I came to learn that they are not really inseparable. The second point he made was that when he brought the leaves every morning to her, was his way of saying that the environment is the determinant of good health. And then when he talked about all the things that happened in the family, he was talking about how the uh, family can play a big part in the health of people. And the makutu that had been placed, a need to recognise that spirituality is part of the journey, and then a overall need to work with two bodies of knowledge. Just to look at those, first of all, the folly of Cartesian dualism, that mental health is on one side and physical health is on another, and they're not necessarily related, was a folly. The uh, New Zealand, like many other countries, built huge mental hospitals, so there was a clear separation between mental illness and other sorts of illness. In fact, New Zealand had the record of having the most mental health beds per head of population for the Western world. Uh, and this had come largely from Descartes' uh, theories about mind and body. Uh, in it, of course, there was the idea that mental illness is essentially different from physical illness, 
uh, the asylums all around the country. The uh, one here was called the Fai Lunatic Asylum, but they were all around, uh, all around New Zealand. Large hospitals, 13, 1,400 patients uh, in each of them, and this clear idea that uh, the mind and the body were separate. But it doesn't really hold up to uh, Maori experience or really to any experience. There are very few disorders where both mental and physical symptoms are not both present. If you look at depression, for example, many of the symptoms of depression are clearly physical symptoms. Changes in weight, low energy levels, sensitivity to cold, abdominal discomfort, constipation, abnormal sleep patterns, and we use medication that alters brain function. Yet it's, it's somehow different from a physical illness. If you look at encephalitis, as we have, the early and late symptoms are often mental symptoms, behavioral changes, emotional ability, thought disorder, hallucinations, abnormal sleep patterns, and disorientation. And that's why the general practitioner thought this girl would be better in a mental hospital, because he thought that was a mental illness. But you see, in virtually every illness you can think about, there is a combination of mind and body. We make a mistake if we separate them as quite different entities. In uh, recent translations of Maori terms for English, uh, for English concepts, depression is translated as manuapodi, which is about a sad heart, something in the body. Anxiety is translated as manuapa, an uneasy heart or a restless heart. Anger is translated as pukuriri, an irate stomach. And dementia is translated as korongingi, tiredness or tiredness that comes with age. So the Maori, uh, Maori terminology tends not to see a difference between the two and integrates, integrates things that we call uh, mental uh, experience with a physical substrate. So the second lesson then had to be about health and the environment. And you remember Cora had brought in the leaves, there were the leaves from his place, there were native trees. And really the more we uh, hear about it, the more we know that you cannot separate health from the environment. We become increasingly concerned about that when we see destruction of environments. Uh, and yet uh, part of my philosophy is you are recognized by the mountain you come from, by the river that's close to you, and by the environment that you live in. And the people in Whanganui, which is a, a town uh, just north of Palmerston North, it's a city actually, uh, Ko O Te Awa, Ko Te Awa Ko O. I am the river and the river is me. So a very strong connection between person and environment. And that uh, dates back to a, uh, an early understanding about creation that Māori had, that we all came from the uh, Rangi and Papa were, Rangi was the sky and Papa was the uh, earth, Rangi was the father, Papa was the mother, and they were in a constant embrace, um, but uh, so, so much of an embrace that there was no daylight, you know what that's like, and uh, over time they had children and children finished all that and pushed them apart and ended the embrace and the children were the forest and the birds and the elements, human, and uh, from that story comes the notion of the ethics of eco-connectedness. There are synergies between people and the natural environment, between human behavior and environment sustainability, between our connections with species, and every form of, uh, every environmental form has its own modi or distinctiveness so that our relationships, that's what the Fanonga principle is about, our relationships with the environment are deep, and if we ignore them, we ignore the possibilities for good health. The third lesson we learned was about families, and the lesson there was that Fano and, and remember this, there'd been an upset in the family, and he said it was a curse, and in some ways it was a curse. Here was a girl who was suddenly deprived of her mother and had to live with her aged grandfather, and that we know that when children are under stress, for whatever reason, they are more susceptible to one form of illness or another. So the whānau have the potential to shape health over the lifespan, from newborn to old age. 
whānau relationships are intergenerational. Any one age group has an impact on the others, and in turn those other age groups impact on them. So uh, the notion, the lesson we learn from whānau is about relationships and the power of relationships to foster good health and well-being. Out of that has come a new project, a new uh, development in New Zealand in 2010, known as Fano Order, which is about uh, trying to get more integration between services, between health and education and social services and housing and all those other dimensions that contribute to health. The Fano Order uh, team of workers, their task is to try and help Fano navigate their way through that uh, seemingly unrelated set of uh, services. But importantly, their other task is to help Fano become self-directing so that their own aspirations can be realised and they can manage them themselves. And very much focused on outcomes and they have developed an indicators that measure best results for Fano. So Fano Waters is still probably in its infancy. There was a review of it done last year, and the review said they thought that this was a hugely important step for Māori health and possibly for the country as a whole, that you take away Fano, take away families from the situation, and you expose people to a greater risk, and particularly health risks. So uh, in the Fano order, Fano is a starting point for a life course approach, and that's uh, emphasis on uh, caring for the new unborn child, and waha could have been developed lately, little baskets that uh, have particular significance and protect a child, uh, guiding rangatira, rangatahi are teenagers, supporting mothers and fathers, caring for the elders, and building relationships, they are the key goals that Fano Order promotes, and they do that by working closely with families with Fano. The fourth uh, lesson had to do with the spiritual dimension. You remember he talked about the Malkutu, <clears throat> and this has all <clears throat> already been covered this morning. Um, a uh, perspective on health which looks at health as being uh, have four key elements, uh, and our task is to lift the spirit. Uh, to ease the mind, to strengthen the body, and to empower the family. They are the, uh, the elements described there, as uh, described initially as a task for medical practice. It's now been used in education and various other, and various other endeavours. They're the uh, if any of you are down uh, near Palmerston North, call into the Aurangi Marae. That's it. Uh, that's it there. It's used as a symbol of that. So it's been uh, a model for its understanding health and well-being. It was developed as a basis for evaluating Maori well-being. Its application probably is much wider than that, and that all people, I think, have uh, their health is dependent on these four. Uh, interrelating elements. Uh, Dr. Takani Kingi has uh, did a outcome framework. One of the difficulties is how do you measure an intervention which is based around spirituality? And these were the four points that he came up with, that after an intervention, doesn't matter what the intervention is, a, do you feel more valued as a person? Are you stronger in yourself as a Māori? Are you more content within yourself? And are you healthier from a spiritual point of view? That last question, he wondered about it, but everyone seemed to know what a spiritual point of view was, even though it may have been difficult to describe. And he was able to measure that on a five-point scale. And he had similar questions for each of the other aspects of uh, tinana, um, whānau, and hiningaro. The fifth lesson had to do with different bodies of knowledge. This was the overall impression that was gained from that discussion with Kuro and from other factors that came into it. How do indigenous and science? 
Indigenous knowledge really has a number of characteristics that make it distinct. First of all, it's holistic. So it doesn't divide things up into little bits. It amalgamates things into a big picture. It's based on accepted truths that what was handed down from generation to generation gives it validity. It's based on encounters with the environment. It has a type of thinking called centrifugal thinking, which is thinking which goes outwards, not inwards. It highlights similarities. The this is a bit I like. The practitioners are older. Uh, the knowledge is enhanced by time, not diminished by time. And indigenous knowledge is evolving, but very slowly. So those are some of the characteristics of indigenous knowledge. When you put that against science, science, far from being holistic, tends to be analytical. It gains knowledge from breaking things into little bits. Science is always skeptical. It, it always re realizes that there's probably a better way of doing things or understanding things. It's based on the measurement of uh, measurement and being able to replicate the evidence. The thinking tends to be centripetal, that is, it goes inwards, not outwards. It uh, highlights differences. The practitioners tend to be younger. I think 30 now is about the cutoff age. The uh, uh, time ages science, so that anything that's been around too long is viewed a bit skeptically, viewed with skepticism. And knowledge is constantly changing. So if you compare those two sets of principles, one holistic on the one hand, the other analytical, one based on accepted truths, the other skeptical about uh, earlier developments, one based on environmental encounters, the other based on the measurement and replicate, replicable evidence, one on centrifugal thinking, the other centripetal, one highlights similarities, the other highlights differences, in indigenous knowledge, the practitioners are older. In science, the practitioners are younger because of the constantly changing nature of science. And indigenous knowledge is enhanced by time, where in science, time ages earlier discoveries. Indigenous knowledge is steadily evolving. Science constantly changes. So quite significant differences between the two. Uh, the question of thinking is an important one. Uh, that centrifugal thinking is a search for meaning by understanding what's outside you rather than what's inside you. And that's a typical way of knowing. You heard this, the speakers today, when they addressed me, they didn't uh, talk directly to me, they talked to the tribes that I came from. And when, you, when we were talking to them, we were talking about Ngāti Whātua rather than the individuals. So the centrifugal thinking tends to get to understand the things and people by going outside them to understand it. And on a marae, if you go to a marae, that's what happens. When people are welcomed to a marae, they're, they're welcomed on behalf of the people they represent. who might be the people who have died, might be their own lands, their own rivers, their own mountains, their connections with others. And that ties people not so much to their individual personality, but to what they represent in a broader society. So if a uh, tribe, uh, if a person comes uh, onto a marae, people are not so interested in who that is, but what tribe do you come from? And if you say, well, I come from uh, Ngāti Awa, people immediately say, ah, oh, well, that would explain it. But the <laughs> centripetal thinking goes in the other direction. It searches for meaning by dividing larger bites into smaller bites. And that's the sort of science that, uh, that certainly I grew up with, certainly in medical school, that if you can understand the very, very finer points, you can put it to understand the person. Uh, so centripetal thinking comes from analysing parts that make up the whole. We can, under, uh, uh, we can analyse organs, tissues, cells, DNA. There is probably no limit to the uh, size, the, this, the finite uh, detail we're looking for. And we place a huge emphasis on that type of thinking in science. 
So this very often we uh, have two questions. What's gone wrong inside you or what went wrong in the world outside you? What is inside these pills or where do these pills come from? What is your name or who are your people? Just different ways of understanding a situation. It's never a question that one is right and one is wrong or that you should do away with a microscope and only use a telescope or the other way around. There are different ways of looking at a problem. And in health, we probably use both approaches. We uh, are perhaps a, a very, uh, use the microscope a great deal, that is we look for what's gone wrong inside. But we also recognize the environment that people work in. We should recognize the environment that people live in, and that's using a telescope where you look outside the person to get a better understanding of the nature of the person and perhaps the difficulties that, may, that they may have. So these were the five lessons then taught by Kuro, the need to consider the inseparability of mental health and physical health, a need to understand the environment as a determinant of health, the importance of whānau and families for health and intergenerational transfers, a need to recognise spirituality as part of the journey to wellness, and a need to work within different cultures and different bodies of knowledge. So for doctors, there are both opportunities and challenges that arise from this. We need to be able to address the body and the mind and the spirit. And that's part of practice. Our practices includes the person and the family. Our practices include the illness and the environment that may contribute to that illness. Our practice should look at the diagnosis but also the socioeconomic circumstances. We should look at the clinical distinction and the cultural distinctiveness. We should look at the grandparent and the grandchild, the whānau and intergenerational links. In other words, I think as doctors increasingly, we are drawn to be able to look beyond, a, beyond the person to look, see what lies outside the person. So each body of knowledge has its own validity if, this, if we're working at the interface, and most of us will be working at the interface increasingly as cultural diversity appears in all our communities. Every body of knowledge has its own validity. Enlightenment can come when two bodies of knowledge can be applied to understanding. The question is not which is better, but how can indigenous knowledge and medical science work alongside each other for a more relevant and authentic understanding. Doctors need to be cognizant of cultural differences in the ways illness is perceived, discussed, explained and managed. Doctors also need to take into account the socioeconomic inequities that so often define indigenous realities. And in working at the interface, we need to recognise that standards of health between indigenous and non-indigenous populations require approaches that go broader than we often do. They require approaches where social and economic policies are as important as the classification of illness, where education and employment are as important as assessment and diagnosis, where housing and incomes are as important as treatment and rehabilitation, and where cultural perspectives are as relevant as medical science. So all those uh, together, if I just quickly go back to uh, 1964, uh, Kora, the girl amazingly did well. She made, uh, and we talk about viral encephalitis in 1964, this girl did fantastically well. Kora, your granddaughter has made a recovery. I knew she would, did you? Yes, her mother called. <clears throat> They've fixed up things in the whānau, and the mākūtu has been lifted. But how's that virus thing? Well, that's been lifted too. <laughs> you can take her home now, call me if there are any problems. Doctor, I have learned a lot from you. I said, that's okay. What I should have said, 
that I didn't know I, at the time was Koro, I have learned much more from you. He said, thank you, doctor. Kia ora, stay well. And I said, kia ora, koro. And that's probably a good way to end this presentation. Kia ora, stay well. <laughs>